Yeah, absolutely. We, we, we absolutely need to manage our resources as good as we can. Meat is not the cheapest protein on the planet. I mean, we, we can use it. Uh, we need to, we need to utilize ruminants, et cetera, to, to get, to convert some non-edible products into, into edible products. And that's a great thing about livestock. You know, we can take a resource that, you, that humans can't use and we can turn it into something they can use. Hello, my folks. Welcome back to the Newspaper Podcast. Today, uh, we continue our conversations with uh, meat scientists, uh, meat industry leaders um, here at AMP, uh, the 83rd edition. And today, we're honored to have uh, one of my professors back at K-State, now at Iowa State, uh, Iowa State Meat Science Meat Extension Specialist, Dr. Terry Hauser. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Francisco, thank you for having me. Welcome. It's been a while. Welcome. And finally, uh, I've been yes. uh, asking you for months and months, and yeah. I, I feel honored <laughs> that finally we got time to, to sit down. And, and with all the uh, uh, situation, pandemic, your kids, my kids, but now we're uh, in Iowa, and I'm just so happy to, to have you on the podcast. Well, I'm, I'm grateful to be here, Francisco. Thank you. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about um, what you're doing at Iowa State. Okay. Uh, a little bit about your role as as extension specialist. Uh, I know you have a lot, a lot of uh, things uh, in on your agenda for for this year yet. And welcome again. Oh well, thank you. Well, it's great to be here and talk about our program. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to come to Iowa State, back to where I went to school and uh, take over the uh, very successful extension program that they've developed over many, many years. And so uh, generally, most of my position is related to extension, and I think most people know that we do a lot of process meets uh, short courses, and we're very active in that part of the training industry uh, for adult learners. And so uh, we we have four process meets uh short courses during the year. We have a cured meat course, a basic sausage course. Uh, we have a dry and semi-dry sausage course. And then we're getting ready to host our summer course, which kind of goes through all of the different products. Uh, since coming to Iowa State, you mentioned pandemic, right? We, we, all, we all talk about that. We had a tremendous amount of questions regarding fresh meat processing. And so we have added significantly uh, to our offerings of short course programming in the beef and the pork space. And so uh, currently we have been running two fresh beef courses a year. We have our own fresh pork course, uh, and we also do a pork 101 in conjunction with the American Meat Science Association. So um, due to that, due to just unprecedented demand in that space, we have a lot of people that are wanting to start their own locker business or expand um their, their beef or pork operation. In addition to that, we got a lot of producers that are interested in knowing more about it in case they want to get into the business. And as we both know, there's a lot of regulations. There's a lot of things that you need to know. Uh, it's not a business you just jump in overnight. And so there needs to be places that you can go and learn about the entire process. So that's what we're trying to do at, at Iowa State. Well, we heard of folks. Uh, I think for for some of you wanting to um, to get more in depth about uh, meat science, meat processing, fresh beef processing, I think this is a good opportunity for for the audience and for for people listening to contact you yep. and contact the, um, the Iowa State Department, the Iowa State University Meat Science Department. Sorry, and we have uh, other things that that we like to cover today, sure. and among those uh, topics. Um, we had a lot of questions and a lot of new folks. We have uh, a lot of new members here in the AMP community yep. that I don't know, may, maybe not very familiar with uh, cattle pricing and meat prices. So I know at K State, um, you were the I was you were the I was first exposed to the USDA Carlot sheet. Um, I mean, with you and yep. you, you, we took a course with that with uh, was it meat technology or. I took a bunch of classes under you. So could you please tell us the importance of the USDA car lot, how uh, meat processors, especially small meat size meat processors, can utilize that information yep. 
um, and, and, and take, it, take advantage of that. Price transparency is very important, uh, it, at least in the U.S. meat industry or any, any industry for that, for that matter. So in the livestock industry or the beef industry, we'll use beef specifically, we have two main ways of, of seeing some price transparency uh, in the marketplace so we know really kind of what cattle are worth and what, what those meat products are worth. And so USDA produces what they call the Carlot Meat Report. That is, that is published every week. Uh, for the preceding uh, trades or meat trades that have occurred uh, in the in the open market, so that doesn't doesn't take into effect forward contracted prices or anything like that. Um, but I think it I think what it does is it gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening on that spot market. So those those are the transactions that occur between a, a packer and a retailer or a distributor, and. Uh, you, if you look up the Carlot Meat Report, uh, you'll see the first several pages are beef prices. They they use the Institutional Meat Purchase Specifications or IMPS uh, numbering system uh, to report those prices. Okay, so for instance, if you're interested in let's say a 112A lip on ribeye, um, you can look that up. It'll indicate uh, what the price range is. Uh, it'll tell you the volume of product that's sold. It'll tell you the number of trades that occurred. In addition to that, it'll give you a weighted average for what those prices, what that cut brings. So what I like to tell folks, especially small or medium sized processors, is this is really the only, well, there are some commercial ones. Uh, Erner Berry, for example, uh, gives some meat price sheet, uh, meat pricing that's certainly valuable. Um, but this is really the only the USDA Carlat Meat Report is the only document that you can really access very easily and for free uh, that can give you an idea of where prices are. It's certainly not perfect, uh, but it gives us an idea what those products should roughly be worth. Okay, in the open market, um, it is valuable for a for a lot of reasons. I think one of the one of the things that I I pull out of the report is seasonality of pricing. Um, it certainly, it might not be to the tenth of, you know, to the dime or to the nickel accurate, but it certainly can tell us when we have increases in demand. Okay. Um, you know, if you use it as an example, if you look in the fall of the year, we have a tremendous pull for ribs and tenderloins before Christmas time or the holidays. And that's reflected in that pricing on that, on that sheet. So I think producers, uh, or at least um, processors, if, if you are not aware of seasonality and prices with meat, there certainly is. Uh, we know that, um, that, that for instance, ribeyes get expensive before Christmas, uh, hams get more expensive before Easter. Um, you know, trim gets more expensive as we get into the summer months, uh, where we're using a lot of those, uh, products for further processed meats. So <clears throat> the USDA Carlet meat report is one that I look at a lot, uh, especially if I'm talking to smaller producers uh, or processors, because that'll give them an idea what, what these meat products are worth on the open market. Now, we can also use the Chicago Mercantile Exchange as far as if we look at live cattle prices. It can give us a, a longer-term view of where cattle prices, or for that matter, lean hog prices, are headed. So you and Francisco, you and I just looked at some of those prices on my phone, and we were talking about the fact that uh, fat cattle prices are are expected uh, to be in the a dollar fifty range per per pound uh, going into well into next year. So if we put that in historical basis, that is some of the highest cattle prices that we have seen uh, historically. Uh, and so it's also telling us, uh, no, they don't have to be right. They're 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 somewhat of a crystal ball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're they're the best. They're the best estimate we have at the current time. So by looking at the CME, um, it gives us a longer term uh, look. And those are those contracts are over a year out for the live cattle contract. Um, and again, it's it's clearly indicating that beef prices are going higher um, into the future. So I think uh, you know next October cattle are at a dollar fifty. So twenty twenty three cattle. 
or dollar fifty. That's that's a good fifteen dollars a hundred weight higher than where we're at right now. So I think that's important to know. Every what we think right now with what we know, uh, cattle prices are going to go higher. And you may ask, why is that the case? So so many we hear about. Uh, drought in California in the Southwest, and now in Texas, uh, we had major drought in in the in the high plains into North Dakota, uh, Montana, uh, South Dakota last year. Some of that drought's easing, but w- we still are not out of this drought. Now it's getting worse in the Southern Plains. So whenever we have those these massive drought issues, cattle herds decrease in size. So if we look at the information from the last four to five years of the cattle inventory here in the United States, that cattle inventory has decreased. Uh, and I believe the last numbers that I saw, we, now we are now at beef cattle numbers below 30 million head of uh, mama cows. And so when we get to those levels, certainly we are, we are in a uh, liquidation phase at this point in time. Uh, adding to that, um, with, with many factors around the world, um, we have a, a, a high set of grain prices that we're dealing with. And since we feed, a lot, we feed our cattle in the United States, Canada, and, and some in Australia and other parts of the world, certainly the price of grain will impact our break-even costs that we have in the feed yard. Transportation too, right? We yes, absolutely. That's one that I didn't throw in there. But yeah, when the, when the cost of a loaded trucking, hauling cattle, a loaded mile almost doubles, we have significant uh, expenses uh, to pay for, so all of that, all of those expenses or inflation, if we want to call it, uh, they've all added up to. It's harder to make money in the cattle industry. So until those, until we have greener pastures, it's going to be tougher for us to uh, increase or or want to increase our cattle herd. So um, something to keep in mind, as I've told. As I tell most people, you know, with the life cycle of that of the beef production, where we where we when we start keeping females back, it takes a a, a great deal of time, three to four years, before another animal is produced from that female, would after it's fully fed out. Okay, so uh, so this is not a short term issue. Uh, we will be seeing higher higher meat costs, or at least beef costs, for the foreseeable future. So. That along with the, uh, like after the, the pandemic, we saw a lot of the, the cattle, and we talk about Dr. Field Bass on that, that cattle is becoming bigger, yeah. right? That's, and, and, and to me, that's one of the things like as, as meat scientists and, and, and meat industry advocates, uh, if meat becomes higher in price, that means like throughout the supply chain, we have to make sure that is used by the end consumer. That's why there's a huge impact that, that can have an impact on chef life because every pound I mean, is going to be so valuable, right? Yeah. So I don't know, getting back to that point, like, okay, if meat gets, becomes more expensive uh, in the next couple of years. We see a lot, I just uh, came back from the IFA show in Germany. So a lot of the, the meat industry, all the equipment is also, um, uh, targeting plant-based products mm-hmm. to maybe uh, counteract, okay, uh, meat is, is going to become higher and higher, maybe other proteins that I'm not I'm not in favor, but I'm not against because there's a community that might not be, um, um, or that meat, those prices especially are not accessible. They're not, mm-hmm. they're not at, a, at a cost, especially in those developing countries where, you know what, what? What can you say about that? Like that combination between, uh, or your thoughts on plan base? I know it was not on the agenda, but I think I mean it's it's a situation, right? Sure. Meat is sure. becoming more expensive, and yeah, at the end of the day, people got to eat, and and if they can't afford meat, uh, they, they're going to have to have something else to go to. So certainly, historically, plant based products, uh, especially soy based products, have fit that haven't they in, in, in part of the developing world. So I don't think that's going away. I, I honestly, when, when I think about, uh, what we do need plant-based protein, we don't have enough meat protein, um, to feed this planet. And you think we have to do more as meat scientists, including more on courses like Iowa state, or I don't know, that's probably in the future. It's going to be rather than 
them fighting that industry is like let's include them into a a maybe not 100 percent meat but maybe 50 sure. 50 because we, we saw a lot of hybrids like you have 50 percent uh beef or pork in the in the formulation but you're adding sure. other things into that and there's a different different uh metrics yep no i think you're uh you're you're spot on on that we only have so many resources across the globe and we certainly know that there's going to be um, the need to I- extend or um, stretch our, our meat protein supply so that we can feed as many people as we can. So I think that's a valid point. Um, I'm not a big, I'm not a big. Hey, let's do uh, plant based protein just because you don't want to eat meat because I don't think there's yeah. anything wrong with eating meat. I think that's why the good Lord put animals on the planet yeah, for absolutely. us to manage and you know be a food source. So. Yeah, absolutely. We, we we absolutely need to manage our resources as good as we can. Meat is not the cheapest protein on the planet. I mean, we we can use it. Uh, we need to we need to utilize ruminants, et cetera, to to get to convert some non edible products into into edible products. And that's a great thing about livestock. You know, we can take a resource that you, the humans can't use, and we can turn it into something they can use. So. Um, yeah, it it we are going to have some challenges, Francisco. That we're going to have to probably get out of our box uh, in in our mindset and and do what we need to do to to be successful going forward. One of the one of the th- topics I did want to touch on uh, when we think about that is that I don't really see the the resource so much as the the meat resource itself as being the limiting factor. Uh, what we're at Iowa State and some others around the country are really focused on is the workforce that we need. Um, you know, we can, the pandemic showed us we can have all the animals we want waiting to be, to go into a kill floor. Uh, but if we can't harvest them, we can't utilize them. So something the, the audience really needs to, to think about is where are we going to get this workforce? What are we doing today that's going to affect us 10 years down the road? And that's where we're at. We're kind of at rock bottom when it comes to, uh, in, in all of agriculture, is to find more people, train them, so that we can produce a you know a food product here that's that's nutritious and safe and all that. And it takes it takes a lot of hands, as you know, because you know you as a teacher there at K State uh, when you're in school, you know that people don't just know this stuff when they wake up in the morning. They have to be taught and they have to have experiences. And we as educators got to get in there and we got to do our our fair share on that and really up our game. To be honest. Yeah, and I, and I think to to wrap up, uh, I have an additional two questions for you, and I and I think it's more um, for your work. And, and going back to you said uh, back at K State, I was it was the first exposure uh, on the kill floor, mm-hmm. um, and and it was to me it was a non traditional way in Mexico, but but here's uh, it's pretty normal that on the first year on a grad school or even or even. Um, some of the junior level classes, senior level classes, to be exposed and be on the kill floor to to get, and I like what what you used to say. Um, you you don't you're not born knowing everything. So the the only way to to learn a job, to learn a a a skill, is by I don't know. You used to say like by destroying the hard. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the only way you learn. I mean, yep. and, and it's. It's uh, that patience that you that you have that you still have to instill those values to, I mean, to the young grad students, the young uh, mid scientists. I think that's I value that a lot. Not not a lot of of people uh, get you that experience. So yep. and, and and again, those those guys uh, six years ago. I mean, now I'm here, but I I went through all that process that that, that helps you, right? So I don't know. That's Having having good uh, faculty and good teachers, and I admire you for that. And and the other thing is how to communicate science to processors. And I think I want to wrap up uh, the episode um, about that topic because yeah, well, you know all the science and PhDs, <clears throat> but if you're not you're not able to translate that knowledge into a layman's terms so that all processors can understand. And this is one of the of the of the objectives of this podcast communicate the things that that sometimes are over 
even our heads and try to put it in a language that can be understood. And I think not a lot of people can do that. And you are the one. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, uh, when you, you communicate in a way that anyone can understand. So how, how, who taught you that? Or Well, I tell you, it's probably because uh, all the Nebraskans that watch this will, will find this hilarious. But since, since I grew up in rural Nebraska, we didn't, uh, our, our education system is good, but I don't have the greatest uh, range of vernacular. So I'm a, I'm a simple guy. So that, that I have to, I always think to myself, how would I understand it if I didn't, if I didn't know anything about the subject matter? And so I try to start from there, but certainly uh, people talk over my head all the time. Okay. Uh, I had to, it's funny because when we were talking about egregious animal handling, I had to go look it up after USDA told us we had a problem with it, which most people laugh at. I didn't, I didn't know what the word was. Um, so, um, so I, I just think of when I try to teach something, I, I take it down to, I start by, okay, what if you didn't know anything about this subject? How would you, how would you relate to it? What do you, what do you know in your own life or you do every day that you could relate it to? And then, then you, then you elevate uh, the conversation from there. And so if my dad went to eighth grade, um, he, he, I would used to, I used to talk to him about my research projects and he'd say, Hey son, how you, how, how's everything going? And I'd start talking about 30 minutes or 30 seconds into the conversation. He'd say, sounds good, son. Uh, that's, that's all we need to know about that. You know? So it's very easy for all of us to talk over, over someone that doesn't know, uh, the language or, or the terminology. Yeah. The terminology of what you're doing. So, um, so if we can, if we remember that, um, which is hard to remember all the time, right? If we remember that we start off and we, we define our terms pretty well and, and relate them to your audience, uh, you get along a lot better. And so, uh, but no, I, I was, a, I was a benefit of, I didn't grow up around educated people. Um, they're real hard. They were very hardworking, but nobody in my family went to college and so, uh, when I go and I tell them what I do, it's certainly, I have to, I got to, uh, back off on some of the big words that I, that we learn here, there in college and, and it, it helps. So put it in layman's terms. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I thank you for that. And one of the things like, um, <clears throat> I, if you know the fundamentals, I would say the, the, the myoglobin triangle, I understand that. I understand how the lipid oxidation works. As long as you understand some of the basics and you understand those well, in 20 years, I mean, you're going to have them here. So it, it's, it's one of those things like you, you don't think about all this at school because once you graduate, you, you don't go back. as like studying and, yep. and being in the classroom and all those things that you see on a daily basis that helps you uh, down, the, down, the, down the road. So. Um, we have more topics, but maybe in the future, uh, next year, in a couple of years, if we keep doing this. If, oh, sure. If, 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 if you yep, guys absolutely. like this content, uh, uh, we have other topics that I'd like to discuss with you. Yep, and, absolutely. Uh, well, if I could make a comment or two for our audience, um, the only thing I would tell you is if you can try to make a difference, uh, do it locally. You know, they say charity starts at home. Um, you know, start a, start a 4-H meat judging um, group or teach somebody how to cook or, uh, you know, just tell somebody what you do and we need all the help we can. Um, we're really important. A pandemic has really shown us that food is pretty darn important. We all, we all kind of knew that we kind of forgot. And, uh, I don't know. I hope people are proud to be in the industry we, we have cause we're really important to society and, uh, it's not going away. We got some major challenges but we're going to have to do it together and we can't just rely on somebody else to educate people. We got to, we got to do our part. So that's what I'd leave people with. And I think we can accomplish a lot, but we're all going to have to get off our butts and, and, and do it. And do the work. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. The Hauser. Thank you for joining us. Um, stay tuned for more content here. Uh, uh the meat spot podcast. Thank you everyone. We'll see you soon.